So don't focus on the provision. Whether it's exactly the manna, the food, the water you want, you focus on the provider, the God who gives it sufficiently Amen. day by day by day. Amen. So how do we relate to this? So first I want to look at how we're in a similar state to the Israelites. So what is the Israelites' state? They complain, they sin, and then in verse 6, the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people. They bit them so that many Israelites died. What you don't see in the scripture is that the snakes bit them and some were hurt a little bit and got better a little later. You don't see, oh, they had to <coughs> cut off the arm where they were bit and they had to live life with three limbs instead of four. No, the only outcome of the snake bite was death. There wasn't a provision for healing. There wasn't a provision for getting around it. It was bite equals dead. That's it. There's no more beyond that. And we stand in the exact same position without Christ. So I'm going to start reading a lot of verses. So I'm going to give you the address if you want to take notes of it, but I don't expect you to turn with me. But I'm going to read Romans 1. I'm starting in verse 18 to talk about how we're in the exact same state. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Clearly says, creation the earth, the sky, everything points to God. And people, whether you're in church or out of church, you know that God exists. It is clearly built into humankind. Yes, verse 21, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. Instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols to, that looked like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. I'll pause right there. Does that not sound like today? We, 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 we refuse to worship God and we make our own. Like God must be like this. Maybe we're in a simulation. Maybe God is this. Maybe No, God says who he is. But people, the sinful heart wants to refuse him, reject him, and say, ah, God's probably this or that. God's whoever I want to make him to look like today. Verse 24 of Romans 1, So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself. Kind of like the Israelites who cared about the creation, the provision instead of the provider. The creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Thank you, Lord. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered with themselves the penalty they deserved. They thought it foolish to acknowledge God. He abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder and quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, innocent, proud, boastful, they invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, they break their promises, are heartless and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires those who do these things, those who do these things deserve to die. Yet they do them anyway. And worse yet, they encourage them to do them too. This could be written today and go, yeah, that totally speaks of American culture. That totally speaks of what's happening in the world. This was written 2,000 years ago. But it speaks exactly what's happening. Man's situation has never changed. In fact, a little bit later, uh, it says in Romans 5, 12, when Adam sinned, 
sin entered the world, and Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. This verse that, this Romans 1 that describes this, full of greed, envious, murderous, lustful, quarreling, all that stuff, that describes me, that describes you, that describes everyone here. That is our state, is that we are sinful and we are destined to sin and we have to sin and we only sin, it's what we do. Romans 3, 19 through 18 says, well then, should we conclude that Jews are better than others? No, not at all, for we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, right. not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. You can read through this and put yourself in there. I have turned away. I have become useless. I do not good. No one does good. No one does good. Not a single one. Their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follows them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. Skip to verse 23 of Romans 3. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So just like the Israelites, they're bit with a snake. A snake bites them, excuse me, and there's no hope. There's only the guarantee of death we stand in the exact same position. We are bitten by the snake, the devil, the sin from Adam, and we are born with this condition that death will happen. Yep. And this is not just a physical death, it's also eternal death, separation from God. That's, that's the snake bite. That's the venom that, hey, without this future hope, this current condition is guaranteed death. Mark 7, 20 and 23 says... It is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's hearts, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceitful, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things come from within that defile you. That's our condition, guys. Without Christ, wretched, vile, hopeless, destined for death. So that's their condition. Now let's talk about the snakes a little bit. So the Lord, verse 6 in Numbers here, says the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people and they bit them. They didn't just happen upon a den of snakes in the wilderness. It wasn't just like, whoops, there's a bunch of snakes. It's, I have a study Bible and it's funny because it's like, actually maybe this carpet viper, blah, 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 blah. I don't think that's real because or I don't think that's right. These are snakes sent from God. Some, this, my version says poisonous, some say venomous, some say fiery. This is awful snakes sent from an angry God. And it's got to be lifted up. That's weird, right? So what those snakes are is they're the judgment of God, right? The people sinned. And so God says, here's the condemnation, here's the judgment. The snakes are going to bite you and you're going to die. This is an awful, wretched thing, this snake. It stinks to be under judgment. It stinks to be penalized, right? Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. The consequence, the judgment for the sin that we've all committed is this death. Hebrews 9.27 says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment in Hebrews 10, 26 through 31, dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. Quick side note there, we are all enemies with God. Everybody before Christ, you are an enemy of God. Verse 28, for anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of only two or three witnesses. 
Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God mercy to us. For we know the one who said, and it's God, I will take revenge. I will pay them back. He also said the Lord will judge his own people. And then 31 is a terrible verse. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. It's crazy, right? This is a very heavy message. And there is hope, and we will get there. But right now, think about the current state. Without hope, sinned against God, and destined to fall into the hands of a living, angry God who dishes out judgment on his enemies. And that's what these snakes are. And the people realize this, and they go to Moses saying, Moses, God, please tell God to take away the snakes. Mm -hmm. And Moses prays, and God says, make a bronze snake and lift it up. Mm. That's offensive. That snake killed my mother. That snake killed my kids. That snake killed everything. It took my life from me, and now you want me to look at it? That's offensive. That's God's judgment. I don't want to see it. I don't want to look at it. Just make the snakes go away, please. You failed. Look at it. You messed up, Israel. Look at it. God is angry. Look at it. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But in the looking, there is healing. Because whoever looks at it, he is healed. Look, and you can live. And that's where it points to Jesus. So now turn with me to John chapter 3. So we all know John 3.16. It is the most famous verse. Even people who aren't Christians know this verse. But just two verses before it in verse, so John 3 verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life because we are destined to perish. So in the looking and believing, there's eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it, so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light, so that by his works may be shown um, to be accomplished by God. So here, 1,500 years after this happens to the Israelites, Jesus makes it all make sense. Why was this snake lifted up? because it's a picture of Christ lifted on the cross. And we know now that Christ came to take that penalty for us, that that death that is deserved by me, that angry wrath of God, Christ took it for us. And so that's what I want to talk about next, is how Christ took it for us. And I want to show you something that I think is just fascinating and phenomenal. So turn back one chapter to John chapter 2. So we're talking about pictures of Christ today. The snake lifted up is a picture of Christ. So I want to talk about another picture that Christ does here. So John chapter 2, is, it's Jesus' first miracle. And everybody knows this, right? What's, what's Jesus' first miracle? Water to wine, right? Another thing that's kind of weird. Why, why is that his first miracle? Out of all the things Jesus does, he, he re resurrects people from the dead. He walks on the water, turns water to wine. Maybe Jesus just wants to tell us we can drink. No, that's probably not right. I don't, <laughs> what's the purpose of this? So let's read. We'll start in verse 6 of chapter 2. <laughs> now six stone water jars have been set there for Jewish purification. Each contains 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water. 
Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim, and then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And they did. When the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, he called the groom and told them, everyone sets out the fine wine first, and then after the people are drunk, the worse wine. But you have kept the fine wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed him. That's weird, right? Water to wine reveals God's glory? That doesn't really compute, but then I want you to think about some of the symbolism here and some of the specific things that the Word of God includes that if you don't think it out, you're like, why is that specific there? So verse 6, there are six stone water jars that have been set there for Jewish purification. Each contain 20 or 30 gallons. Either John really liked jars, and he just had this fascination with it, or he had a purpose for including this there. Those jars were set there for Jewish purification. That was specific, ritually clean water that is used to clean the Israelites before they go and present themselves to God, before they give sacrifices, before they worship God. It is meant to cleanse them. That's why that water's there. And water so often is a picture of God or of salvation or of Christ. So look at some of these verses. John 4, 14. So just a couple of chapters later in this same book, he's talking to the woman at the well. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will be a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jeremiah 2.13 says, For my people have committed two evils, and they have forsaken me, God, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah 17.13, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Ephesians 5.26, this is Christ and the church, that he, Christ, might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water of the word. Ezekiel 36.25, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your iniquities, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And there's more. Google it. Do a study on it. There's a lot of verses about the living water. And water is a picture of Christ or, and God's cleaning and washing away of iniquities. And here's the purification water. The water set aside. This is a picture of Christ. Christ comes to take away our sins. He is the pure, spotless lamb. So Christ is the water here. And then I want to read some verses that talk about wine. And so listen to this. And tell me if you can figure out what the wine is, what, what wine often pictures, what God uses as wine to picture. So we'll start in Psalm 60, 1 through 3. You have rejected us, O God, and broken our defenses. You have been angry with us. Now restore us to your favor. You have shaken our land and split it open. Seal the cracks for the land trembles. You have been very hard on us, making us drink wine that sent us reeling. Psalm 75, two, uh, 2 through 8. Actually, excuse me, just uh, Psalm 75, 7 and 8. It is God alone who judges. He decides who will rise and who will fall. For the Lord holds a cup in his hand that is full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours out the wine in judgment, and all the mu wicked must drink it, draining it to the dregs. And dregs is a weird word. I had to Google it. <laughs> dregs are like when you brew a cup of coffee and you have those grinds, those few grinds that get on the bottom, that's the dregs. And God is saying, the wicked will drink my wine of judgment down to the very sediment in the last drop. Isaiah 51, 17. Wake up, wake up, O Jerusalem. You have drunk the cup of the Lord's fury. You have drunk the cup of terror, tipping out its last drops. Not one of your children is left alive to take your hand and guide you. These two calamities have fallen on you, desolation and destruction, famine and war. And who is left to sympathize with you? Who is left to comfort you? 
For your children have fainted and lie in the streets, helpless as antelopes caught in the nap. The Lord has poured out his fury. God has rebuked him. But now listen to this. You afflicted ones who sit in a drunken stupor, though not from drinking wine. This is what the sovereign Lord, your God and defender says. See, I have taken the terrible cup from your hands and you will drink no more of my fury. Instead, I will hand that cup to your tormentors, those who said, we will trample you to the dust and walk on your backs. Jeremiah 25, 17 and 18. So I took the cup of anger from the Lord and made all the nations drink from it, every nation to which the Lord sent me. I went to Jerusalem and the other towns of Judah and their kings and officials drank from the cup from this day until this. Jeremiah then 25, verse 27 and 28. The Lord said unto me, now tell them, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, drink from this cup of my anger, get drunk and vomit, fall and rise no more, for I am sending terrible wars against you. And if they refuse to accept the cup, tell them, the Lord of heaven's army says, you have no choice but to drink from it. Amen. Obadiah, verse 16 just as you swallowed up my people on the holy mountain, so you and the surrounding nations will swallow the punishment I pour out on you. Yes, all the nations will drink and stagger and disappear from history. And lastly, Revelations 14, 9 and 10. Then a third angel followed them, shouting, Anyone who worships the beast and his statue or accepts the mark on his forehead or hand must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured out full strength into God's cup of wrath and they'll be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. Yeah. So do you see it? Do you see how many times God calls his wrath and his anger a cup of wine? It is foaming, it is red, and it is ready to be poured out. And it is so furious and fearsome that it makes you stagger like a drunken man. And that's another thing that this verse in, in John, this passage, is weirdly specific about. Not just that these jars were purification water, but that this wine, it wasn't just wine, because that in of itself is pretty amazing. No, it was the strongest of wines. So much that the, the head waiter went to the groom and was like, are you kidding me? This is totally weird. This is the best wine ever. No one does this. And in this miracle, Christ's glory was revealed. Do you see it now? Christ, the purification water, the Lamb of God who is spotless and sinless and blameless, he comes. And that wine, that cup of God's fury that we are supposed to drink, that is meant for us, he becomes it. And he takes it. And that is the glory of Christ. That's amazing right there. And to really drive this nail home and to really see this, Go with me to Matthew 26. I'm going to turn there. We're going to be in verse 38. And he said to them, this is Jesus, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And you know if you're familiar with this passage, this is just moments before Judas comes, betrays him, and we start the crucifixion, and we start Christ's betrayal. Verse 39. I'm going to get there. And he went a little farther, and he bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, and there's an exclamation mark here. This isn't just a, a, a recitation. This is Jesus earnestly play, praying, greed to the point of death. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. What's the cup, church? It's Christ, or it's, it's God's wrath. It's God's angry judgment that we deserve. Let it be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray that so you will not give into temptation for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. 
And then Jesus went a second time and prayed, My Father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. That cup is mine. I'm the one who sinned. I'm the one who's bitten by the snake and the only hope, the only outcome is death and God's judgment, angry and foaming, ready to be poured out. And Christ steps into the scene and says, I'll take it. It's fearsome. It's scary. It's awful. It grieves Christ to the point of death, but he says, I'll do it. And that's where this amazing miracle happens. That's where we see Christ lifted up on the cross. And so now when the Israelites look at the snake and they see God's judgment, that's what we see in the cross as well. You see, the cross has been so Americanized and modernized. It's pretty. It looks nice. There's, there's pictures of Jesus hanging there with just a, a little drop of blood. And it doesn't quite picture exactly what that is. That is a picture of God's angry judgment that I deserved. It was my place, and Christ takes it for us. And so we look at that, and we, we, we hear these messages that, that God is love, and he absolutely is. The Bible says that God is love, but God is also a just God, and a righteous God, and a thrice holy God, who requires judgment to happen. You see, if you go back to the Numbers passage, the Israelites said, take the snakes away. Did God take the snakes away? No, in fact, he made a, a pitcher, lifted it up, so that anyone who bit it is still there. The judgment had to remain because he is just. So now, just like we had to look, there is like to look at the snake, we look, we look at your failure. When you see that cross, you need to see God's wrath. And then on the flip side of it, on the other side of the cross, you see God's love and Christ's propitiation, his perfect appropriate payment for our sin. He drank that cup down to its dregs for us. Hebrews 9, uh, 9 verse 11 through 12 says, So Christ has now become the high priest over all good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, and not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow could cleanse people's bodies from, ceremonial, uh, from ceremony impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciousness from the sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And then in verse 28, so also Christ died once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly awaiting for him. Do you see what Christ did for us, guys? Do you see how he is a picture of the serpent lifted up, a picture of God's judgment meted out on our behalf? I want to turn to Isaiah 53. And we're going to read 1 through 10. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him no appearance that we should desire. And guys, I want you to really pay attention to this. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sickness, bore my sickness. He carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed 
by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord was, uh, has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he opens not his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before her shearers. He did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. But he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, you will see his seed. He will prolong his days. And by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. It pleased the Lord greatly. It satisfied him. That judgment that has to be paid because God the Father is just. And there was an error. There was a wrong that had to be righted. And in Jesus, that wrong was righted perfectly. There's an illustration I heard you may have heard it as well that I think fits it perfectly, and it's, it's how offensive our sin is to God. If, if I took a knife and I went out and I just scratched a rock, no one cares. It's a rock. It's here, it's there, it's everywhere. There's trillions of them. If I go and scratch a tree, again, people probably wouldn't care that much. If I go and scratch a car, it starts to be a little bit differently. Maybe it's a junker, and the person's treated it poorly. They may not even notice another scratch. But if I go find a $100,000 Lamborghini that's in pristine condition and I scratch it, I could literally go to jail for that because it's so offensive that I would hurt something that valuable. God is infinitely holy, infinitely righteous. And, and righteousness and holiness often get conflated. They're not the same thing. Righteousness is speaking of God's moral standing, that there is no sin, that there is no imperfection in him. He is perfectly pure. Holiness is actually comes from the words means to cut and to separate. You see, we are here. We are in this category of humans and sin, uh, sinful, excuse me, and God is in his own category of himself. He is not like us. He is completely different than us, and inside of that rests his righteousness and his holiness and his lovingness and his mercy. And when we sin, it is not just hurting a Lamborghini. It is not just hurting another person. You said, I want you to think of King David. He commits his great sin, right? And for those of you who don't know, David sees another woman. He wants her. And so he has her husband go to war, get killed, and then he takes her. So number one, he commits murder. He lets his people down, and he commits adultery. But in Psalm 51, when David writes his confessional psalm, he doesn't say, I sinned against Uriah and Bathsheba, against my people. No, he says, God, to you and you only have I sinned. And when we sin, that is what we're sinning against, a holy, perfectly separate, righteous God. And so there has to be a judgment met out. There has to be justice because you can't offend the living God without there being a consequence. And that's where Jesus steps in and the perfect son of God takes our place and we get his righteousness and he takes our judgment. Wow. I love it. I, I, the Lord has been putting this message in me over and over and over and I can't stop but just go hallelujah. And so what do we do with this, church? So where, where, where do we stand now? So we kind of take the same place as Moses, being Christians now, being changed, is that we get to look and we get to lift. So I want to read Le Revelations 5 with you guys. So go with me to Revelation 5. If I can get there. So keep in mind the context of everything we just talked about, of how undeserving and the fate, fearful state we were, we were in and in what Christ did for you and how he took that foaming wrath. Revelation 5. 
Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even look in it. And I wept and I wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to even look in it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures among the elders who had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sit into all of the earth. He went and he took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. And here we go. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and every language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also the living creatures and the elders and their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands and they sang with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven, on earth and under the earth and in the sea and everything in them, saying blessing and glory and power to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, it is true. And the elders fell down and worshipped. That is our Christ. Worthy is the Lamb. Yes. Worthy is the one who was slain. Thank Worthy you. is the Son of Man. So when you look at that cross, you. you on one hand see your condemnation, but on the other you see, Worthy is the Lamb of God. You, Worthy is Him. So we look to Christ in our daily walk. So now look at Hebrews 12. Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip aside every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. If we stop there, you might have a question, how do I do that? How do I run the race with endurance? Verse 2 answers it. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. Amen. Run your race. Live your life. Endure how I look to Christ. That's, right. That's it. There's the key to the Christian life. You keep your eyes on Christ. You keep your eyes on the one who is worthy. You keep your eyes on the one who took the judgment for you. That's how you do it. So keep your eyes on Christ. So what does that mean? Look at him. Adore him. I love my wife. I am in love with Kristen. I love you. <laughs> and one thing I do is I, I look at her. When we have a date and we go and we sit across the table from each other, I look at her. And because I have an intimate relationship with her, I know her eyes are green. But when she's sad, her eyes turn a little bit blue. And I know she has freckles that I like, and I know there's a little bit of hint of red that bumps off her hair because I've taken the time to sit and adore her over the years. We do the same thing with Christ. We sit at his feet and we adore him. We look at him. When we're in fellowship with one another, it's not about looking at the conversation Tony and I have or that Tommy and I have. It's about Christ in you. And I sit there and I adore Christ in you. And I get in the word, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. This is a way to see Christ. And you look at it and whether you're in Numbers or Revelation or Matthew or Genesis, you look and you say, where's the face of Christ? 
Where is he? Because I want to see him. I want to adore him. And so you're not getting in the word of God to get more knowledge. You're not getting it because you're supposed to. You're getting in it because you love the one who it represents, the one who is a picture of. So look, church. Look to Christ. See what he's done for you. And then lastly, lift him up. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Isaiah 43, 7 says, bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. Our job is to look at Christ and to lift him up to others. Matthew 5, 14 and 16, you are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. And this is where I'm going to end with that, this thought here. Because we have been changed and remade and we're saved with Christ, now God who is the light is in us. And we are supposed to be like a city on a hillside. And if you think about that, nowadays it doesn't really mean a whole lot to us, but back then it would have. Because of wars and things like that, a city that's up on a hill is exposed and it's vulnerable and it means its light is shining. They're not hiding, it is evident. And so if you are a person who is weary and you're stuck in the wilderness and you're wandering and you're almost to die and you see a city on a hill, you go, well, I know salvation's there. I know water and food and shelter is there, so I'm going to go. And because that light is there, other people come right. and they're rescued. On the flip side, there are also people who see the light and there are burglars and thieves and bad people who are say, there's life there. I can take advantage of that. I, I, can, I can, you know, use them. We're not called to worry about any of that. God says, look at Christ and be a city on a hill by letting your good deeds. And we can go into that, but church, we know we've just had a whole week of spiritual, or of, of teaching of, of spiritual doctrine and how that anything that good comes out of you is Christ in you. And that any good fruit you have is the fruits of the Spirit. And so your good deeds are letting Christ shine out from you. And God says he calls all men to himself. So it's not your job to go and, and win that person because you don't do the winning you don't do any of it. You simply let Christ do it, and God is the one who draws people. And if somebody abuses you or uses you, it's not about getting vindication or getting them because Jesus, as God says, we read earlier, he is the one who does the repaying. So don't focus on the other side. Don't get bogged down by the weights and stuff. Look to Christ, and in doing so, adore him and love him and worship him and let God take care of the rest. Praise God. You better give God praise right now. Help me move this down, brother. Yeah. This is my strong arm. Um, the worshipers can come up. That'd be great. Um, I'm extremely overwhelmed. Um, the world spends generations 